this. Um, Let me just mute this. Us. There we go. Now I don't hear myself on a delay. Anyway, um, it's a great day, beginning of February. This is our 10th episode that we're doing, so that's very exciting. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been almost a year that I've been doing these every month. It's a great chance to speak with you directly and also to get a lot of feedback from you, answer some questions, and find out what's important uh, from you and about you and what you're looking for. You know, I get a lot out of these sessions. Uh, a lot of people call in to chat. You can go to your YouTube channel and there's an online chat there. It's real time, I'm gonna see that. Other people in my office are monitoring those. And uh, so we'll respond to you. And also we've had some great chats between people on the, uh, the chat window as people ask questions of each other and respond to it with information. You know, that's what's really great about Sperling's Best Places, bestplaces.net uh, is where people can ask questions and get questions answered not only from us, uh, myself and other people in our office, but also from other people in the community. Because, you know, as much as I know about places to live and I do a lot of research and compare places and try and share that with you, you're the expert where you live. And you're trying to find out something special about some other part of the country, but there are people that know exactly what you're trying to find out. They have the answers. So when you come to Sperling's Best Places, you can pose these questions and uh, you might be fortunate that someone has just the answer you're looking for and will go ahead and comment that. You know, we have some stuff going on at Sperling's Best Places that's uh, really exciting. Uh, let me go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Number one is our commenting system. We're redoing our whole messaging and commenting. We have uh, Dana, Dana Bridges is working on that in our office, Al Olson, uh, is making that happen. Uh, Dana is the designer and the user interface person. Al Olson is our uh, engineer who takes Dana's ideas and visions and, and makes them uh, reality on the web as much as things are ever real on the web. And um, let's see, who else we have? We have Bertrand and Ted working on it as well, uh, making great content. And Nick Arnold uh, is working on maps and such. So that's really important. So anyway, um, let's see what else is new and great. Um, we have some things to go ahead and talk about. Let me see what we we're going to say here. We have some notes. Okay. We have something new. You know, we have a, a comfort index. What we've done, we've uh, spent a lot of time with this and we've gotten some great comments and feedback from you folks. So what we have found is that what is comfortable to you? You know, what we do here at Sperling's is try and take data and information and make it relevant. We try and put some thought behind it and come up with some numbers you can use instead of pouring over all of this yourself. And, you know, we have some users that are doing a great job finding things out and doing research on our site and uh, trying to make sense of it all. But we, what we try and do is we try and do that for you too. So what we do is we'll take a lot of numbers and try and derive an index. Now, one of these that we're doing is a comfort index. And what is comfortable as far as a climate to you? Um, we're getting some feedback from folks. Uh, somebody was telling us in Key West, Key West, Florida sounds like a lovely place to live. In fact, I lived there for a while, nearly a year, uh, when I was just about 10 years old. And it was great. I remember it. Uh, I had just, um, I think we had just moved from Oslo, Norway. <laughs> so uh, my dad was in the Navy and I was 10 years old and uh, we spent some time in Key West and it was a pretty amazing place to spend some time growing up. I don't remember how bad the humidity was, but this person wrote in with a comment and they said it was miserable. It was terrible. And you know, you wouldn't think of it. Key West sounds like it's such an amazing place to be, but he said that, um, it is uh, really beyond what you can imagine. In fact, I think his, his brother, a member of his family, came down from Atlanta, Georgia, and he couldn't believe it. He said, this is, you wouldn't, <laughs> folks in Atlanta wouldn't believe how much worse the humidity could be. So that's something to think about. So what we've figured in is we've gotten the uh, average temperatures 
uh, over a period of, I think about 20 years, and for every day of the year, and we've looked at the high temperature and the low temperature, and we also have humidity for all of those days. And what we've looked at is compared the, uh, we've found the ranges of temperature uh, where it stays within a certain range and also looks at the, um, uh, at the humidity. And we've really dialed up that humidity because a lot of people have told us how really unpleasant high humidity is. So we're gonna come out with comfort indices, not just for one period of time like we have now, but we're going to be looking at all uh, the whole part of the year for every month and most importantly for the spring, summer, winter, and fall. So you can have a pretty good idea of uh, what is the most comfortable places and times of the year for those places and exactly how those places compare against all the others. So it's gonna be pretty cool. Anyway, Nick Arnold is working on that and doing a great job. Real exciting uh, to see, and I'm really excited to be able to show that to you very soon. Um, let me see, The um, we're gonna have a mobile app. Uh, Jason is working on that I'm back in uh, New York State uh, for us. He's doing a great job, and uh, I'm very excited. We're gonna use a lot of our indices so that with a mobile phone, you're not gonna have a lot of um, chance to really do a lot of research. Of course, you're gonna be on the go. It's a small screen. We're reducing everything to indices so you can have a, um, a good idea uh, quickly uh, about what are the best places to live. Uh, and get this, this is, very, this is very Oregon, Portland. We're designing a board game. We're designing a best places to live board game. So what's happening is uh, we're looking for um, something fun and playable, and it's based in the real world. So you can uh, take a look at, um, you, as you play the game, you're going to be looking at different cities and what's special about them and what are the pros and cons in moving there. And it's gonna be educational as well as fun. We're working with a couple of board game designers here in Portland. Uh, we're gonna have that available maybe in a couple of months and if you'd like to help test it, we'd love to get your input on it. So um, shoot me an email, let me know, put board game somewhere in the subject and uh, we'll be sure to go ahead and talk to you about that. So anyway, best places to live board game. It should be fun. Um, we are also working on a climate filtering, sort of a find your best climate feature. Nick is working on this. And uh, since he's a mapping guy, it's gonna be map based where basically you set filters on what kind of rainfall you'd like, what kind of temperature, uh, how much humidity you're willing to tolerate or avoid. And uh, you can dial that in and the map will change in real time showing you the best parts of the country uh, for you. Then you can click on it and then home in on those places and uh, save them to your profile and everything like that. So it's gonna be really interesting. We've got a lot of exciting developments coming here on bestplaces.net. And uh, hope, hopefully uh, you can um, come back many times. Uh, tell us what you think and in, tell us what you see and um, what it means to you and maybe make some suggestions for improvement. So that's very cool. Let's go ahead and take some questions uh, here. On, uh, in February 2017. I can't believe it's already 2017. That's kind of crazy. And not only that, it's the second month. So um, that's, that's amazing. Uh, someone, uh, Thomas, is saying he is considering a move to Santa Rosa uh, County, uh, which is around Fairhope, uh, Daphne, um, or uh, Santa Rosa, Florida. Santa Rosa County, Florida is near Pensacola, or he's, using, he's looking in the Mobile, um, Alabama, Mo Mobile, Alabama um, area uh, around Fairhope or Daphne. Uh, and those are a little bit uh, to the east across the bay from uh, Mobile. And he said the cost of living is low for a coastal area, uh, but it is a slightly above average on a national basis. I checked some of the figures for Thomas and found, yeah, the cost of living is pretty much the same in, in both of those. Uh, the weather is good for him because he has a heart condition and the weathers in the winters in the north are becoming too much. Yeah, well, that's, uh, they can be brutal. Uh, he was never there in the summer, but he's asking me what it is really like in the summer. Um, well, 
I don't know where you're coming from, Thomas, uh, what part of the uh, country you're coming from. So otherwise I could give you a comparison. But it is, uh, it's pretty bad. I'm going to assume like much of the population in the US, you're on the uh, eastern part or the Midwest, east of the Rockies, I'll, I'll put it that way. So you know what humidity is like. Uh, let's face it, everywhere east of the, of the Rockies is going to have significant humidity during the summertime. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be sticky and unpleasant for probably at least a couple of months out of the year. Uh, but if it's good for you and your heart, that's something you can put up with and uh, maybe sit on a porch, read a book. Um, don't do, don't do too much and, and try and get through it. I was there in Mobile. Gee, I think we were doing our road trip. I was there uh, in like uh, March, uh, beginning of April. I could tell the humidity even in early April. Uh, it was thick, sort of. It was like um, like a wet blanket, sort of. Even though the temperature was only like in the low 70s, um, you could definitely feel it was going to be humid uh, later on in the year. So um, that's something to think about. Um, but I think there are good livable places, depends on your uh, income. You know, Florida doesn't have, uh, well, the taxes are very low in Florida. And uh, so you might go ahead and think about that. But um, as far as climate, uh, they're going to be uh, hot and sticky. But check out our climate index. We're going to have a lot more information on the site about that. And uh, looking forward to seeing what you think about it. Um, we have, uh, here's someone who lives uh, in Bellevue, Washington. Um, and Kathy said, it's been wonderful, especially in the 1990s. <laughs> However, lately it has grown so much, exclamation point. It has gotten crowded, expensive, and yet it is so dynamic and vibrant. Some stores have left due to high rents and others have moved in. We're having a challenge and don't know where to retire. Do you, how do costs compare to places um, like Lake Oswego, Oregon, or other locations in Oregon. Um, Bellevue is just east uh, of the um, of Seattle. Uh, it is uh, near Microsoft, uh, and it is really high end. It is getting really expensive there. Seattle has taken off like a rocket. It's sort of uh, we had picked it as some of the best places to live in the 1990s. And uh, it went through sort of a dip, uh, got sort of ignored, uh, but lately high tech has come back in a big way. And just like San Francisco, the high tech means high prices. And uh, a lot of people are finding it unaffordable. Uh, some places uh, like nearby Tacoma uh, are getting um, uh, sort of discovered, gentrified, if you will. And the thing about uh, Tacoma is that it was sort of gritty and sort of um, kind of um, kind of a uh, gritty. Yeah, I'm gritty. I'd say is is the nicest thing you can say about it. So uh, it was kind of a gritty place to live, and but it was cheap uh, because people wanted to live at other places around in the Seattle area, and that's just south of uh, of Seattle. And what we're finding is that now people are um, are discovering the cheaper places and living in Tacoma. It's becoming pretty much the hip and cool place right now. Uh, lots of interesting things are happening in Tacoma. Um, but Kathy said, I'm guessing, Kathy, if you live in Bellevue, you probably have the resources uh, to live somewhere nicer. Uh, and you know all about Tacoma probably because you're in the Seattle area. Uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon, you asked about. It's a really upscale place. Uh, it's very sort of um, Orange County. If you're a West Coast kind of person, you know Orange County being kind of wealthy uh, and more conservative. And uh, Lake Oswego is very nice for that. As far as prices, you can, if you want to live on the lake, Lake Oswego actually has a Lake Oswego and it's very nice. You can pay easily well over a million dollars for a home um, on the lake. But if you want to move away from there or in, in the area, um, it's going to be uh, much cheaper, of course. And Lake, lake Oswego is, has a really nice little downtown. And um, none of the places, I would say, are exactly inexpensive. But hey, like I said, you probably have the resources to afford it. 
other places that are maybe a little more, they're more affordable. Uh, they're kind of, um, they're going to be the next big thing. The next big thing in Oregon, I'm pretty convinced in Portland anyway, is going to be the outlying areas. Portland is, is rocketing up in prices. Uh, you could look at Selwood. That's getting more expensive. But uh, Milwaukee, for people who are looking for a bar bargain, that's just south of town, out of Portland. And um, it's called Milwaukee with spelled not with two E's, K-E-E, -E, like Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's K-I-E, Milwaukee, Oregon. And uh, that's going to be a, a hot spot. It's just getting gentrified and getting developed. Also look at Gresham um, and um, maybe Hillsboro, uh, some of the areas around there. Uh, but basically, you're going to pay more money the closer you are to the city center. So um, there's that to think about. Uh, good luck with your move. And uh, other places, Bend. Bend is really hot. If you want more of an outdoor experience like Boulder, Colorado, Bend is really growing very quickly. has a lot of amenities. By amenities, I mean cool things to do, good restaurants, um, uh, craft brewing, uh, and you have the winter weather in Bend that you don't get in the western Oregon, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, so you have a lot of outdoor uh, type of um, adventure things to do, skiing um, and uh, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, hiking, uh, canoeing, that sort of thing. And uh, so Bend's going very fast. Hood River is another great place here in Oregon uh, for people who do windsurfing. Um, that is one of the best places in the world. And it's a lovely spot. That's out on the Columbia Gorge, east of Portland. So those are some places to think about. And, uh, you know, Hood River is a little bit out of town, but it's only about an hour away from Portland. You can come in, uh, have some fun on a Saturday evening uh, or Saturday, do shopping, have a, a great meal, and then you're back home again in an hour. It's not a big deal. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, let's go to the chat. Um, Becky said uh, she lives in upstate New York and it is not good. Um, Becky said it kind of sucks, in other words, <laughs> uh, her words. Um, we've been thinking of moving to Wisconsin towards the Oshkosh area. Uh, what's the thought about Wisconsin? Uh, that's a good question. Wisconsin is coming back. There's sort of uh, parts of it are redeveloping after um, the downturn in the economy. And the economy has not been uh, great there. Uh, you've heard all about the Midwest and uh, the uh, loss of uh, manufacturing, not just auto, but everything connected with auto, like small parts. I would look for places that have a great, um, well, no place is going to be great, but there are some places uh, in the in Wisconsin that are doing better than others as far as the economy. Look for a place with a low unemployment rate uh, where the job growth is decent. Look for population growth that's growing. Um, and that's one of my tips. If you're going to look for a new place to live, look at the population growth. Is it growing or is it decreasing? You don't want to move to a place where the population growth is shrinking or at least hey, it might be the right place for you, just do it with your eyes open. But if people are leaving, there's usually a reason, and it's not a good thing. You don't want to be sort of caught in that cycle where things are not doing well, because what's going to happen is uh, if the economy is bad, your social services are going to be cut, um, schools, uh, emergency services, fire and police, uh, parks, these sort of things, you get into the cycle and it's going to be very tough. Um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a happy place to live if you don't go to a place, uh, if, if you go to a place where the economy is, let's say it's challenged. On the other hand, you don't want to go to a place where it's booming, where it's crazy, because I'm really convinced that if things are sort of out of control, um, if things are growing so fast, People are preparing for the future, and some of those projects may never even get built. They're over committing and over preparing because that's what you have to do when things are really booming. Just like in North Dakota, when they had the boom from the shale, some towns like Williston, 
uh, and those places, they were caught. They had so many people that they had to try and prepare for them, and I'm afraid they're going to suffer the consequences of that huge boom and the huge revenue. All this money came flooding into the area. Now it's tapering off, and it's going to be really challenging. So big tip, look for a stable uh, economy. Oh, by the way, here's a tip for finding a place with stable economy. State capitals will have a great uh, stable economy because they're government workers. They're going to work. They're not going to go undergo big layoffs or whatever. Very stable. College town. College towns are also great. Make sure it's a good sized college. And if it's a college town, again, stable employment, people are going to go to a college even in bad times uh, because they want to try and improve their skills and uh, be more marketable in the job market. So college towns, and there's great amenities and things to do. You can go to a college town with 50,000 people and it'll be as vibrant with interesting restaurants and um, uh, let's see, what do they have at the colleges? They have like the arts and lecture series and everything. You're gonna have concerts, you're gonna have sports uh, with the college team uh, if it's a good sized school and there are going to be so many interesting things to do. So look for a college town and look for a uh, at state capitals are also great as well. Um, let's see, uh, we have uh, someone, Samantha writes in, says, my husband and I are 79 and 82. He is a professional jazz drummer and I'm a clinical social worker. We are both still active professionally. We're happy in Sarasota, Florida, but need to lower our cost of living drastically. And Tennessee beckons. We want to continue in an independent senior living residential community. Where do you think we'd find what we want? A jazz music population, moderate weather, low costs in Tennessee. Maybe Memphis, Knoxville, or Nashville. Okay, so um, anyway. Cool, being a jazz drummer and, and still doing it. You know, Nashville has such a music scene. It's kind of a cliche, and it's easy to just go ahead and say it. You know, Nashville is a music center, but it really does. It has so much going on. And he's going to find people that he can play with much more easily than you can in other places. And they're going to be um, ex-professionals uh, like himself um, and uh there is just so much happening in the Nashville area as far as the culture. He's going to find some people to uh, to play with uh, that are going to be um, really, um, I'm sure, everything he wants. And there's maybe uh, cafes that are going to have live music. Uh, he can get gigs, that sort of thing. So that it has that going for it. It's going to be much more of a challenge uh, in somewhere like Knoxville, um, Memphis. Uh, we went uh, through Knoxville recently, really neat town. It's, it's going, it's growing. Um, it's, it's, it has some really good things going on in Knoxville. I was very impressed with what I saw there. It's going to be a smaller town. It doesn't quite have, of course, the music culture, what does, like, um, like Nashville. Um, but there are places like uh, Murfreesboro, uh, which is south of Nashville, uh, which is a smaller town. It might be of course, the more you get into town, uh, the more expensive it's going to be. If you're looking, oh, there's what's the name of that really neat town? Um, gosh, I forget. Just south of uh, Nashville. Um, but uh, as far as um, I'll look that up here in a minute. Uh, Knoxville, uh, anyway, is going to be cool, but it's going to be smaller. It's going to be less expensive than Nashville, but you're going to find places in Nashville that are affordable if you look for them. Um, but just the cost of living is going to be higher. Uh, Memphis is, um, spent some time in Memphis uh, working with one of our uh, partners uh, with Best Places. And what we found uh, was uh, Memphis is challenged as far as its economy. Uh, FedEx is there, um, but basically it's uh, it has a high unemployment rate, and there is a lot of um, a lot of poverty uh, in Memphis. I would say that um, even though it does have a rich music tradition of soul uh, and R and B, 
uh, it's nothing vibrant currently like it is in uh, Nashville. So I would look in the Nashville area and um, or maybe Knoxville as well. Um, also, hey, maybe your husband can talk to some folks in a uh, in the music scene. Uh, maybe you can hook with, up with them online, ask some questions and he can get a feeling himself or to, hey, take a visit. Uh, it's not that far. Uh, Sarasota is not that far. Uh, go up for a, a week, uh, check out the scene, and uh, you'll have a lot better idea and see what's good for you. So that was Samantha in Sarasota. Um, someone, uh, Ron, says, what's the formula for our comfort index? I assume it takes into account humidity, days of precipitations, et cetera. It's not as, uh, but that it is not as complicated as the Golden Gate Weather's Camelot Index or as simple as Kelly Norton's Pleasant Day uh, calculation. Well, Ron, um, it is, it's not quite as complicated as the Golden Gate Weather's Camelot Index, which is pretty good. Uh, I like that. Uh, and you're right, it isn't as simple as, um, the Norton Pleasant Day calculation. Norton's calculation doesn't figure in humidity. I think that's a big problem from what I've heard back from people. They really do not like humid weather. It really is actually the point of being debilitating uh, as far as uh, knocking them out for, you know, they can't go around and do things. Um, they, you know, have to stay inside and that sort of thing. Um, and also here's something else actually, it can be life-threatening. High humidity reduces your uh, body's ability to get rid of excess perspiration. So uh, that means your body cannot cool as well if it stays hot at night. Uh, your body cannot recover during the night when it's cooler, when it should be cooler. Then um, you're less likely to um, be healthy uh, and withstand the heat of the next day when it temperature ramps up again. So yeah, humidity is really bad. Um, anyway, the Norton Pleasant Day calculation doesn't take that into account. Uh, the Golden Gate Weather's Camelot Index does take into precipitation days and everything. We did not figure that in. We haven't looked at the number of precipitation days. Uh, and why? I guess because um, it doesn't always tell the whole story. Uh, here, it drizzles a lot here in the Northwest. In fact, just as far as rainfall, we get uh, as much, we get less rain here in the Portland area than they do in New York City. <clears throat> now you don't hear New York City uh, folks complaining about the, uh, the rain in New York City that much. And that's because it has almost six weeks per year less of rainy days. If you're gonna count out the number of days with rain, Portland gets about 90, uh, what would that be like? Um, yeah, 90 days, no, I'm sorry, that would be like 45 days more per year, six weeks uh, of rainy weather. So what we do is we get a lot of drizzly overcast days. And I don't know, to me, that's not that bad. I will go ahead and take that um, over, say, high humidity or whatever. I stay inside, get a lot of work done, or you just get used to being out in the drizzle. It's not bad. It's not a lot of big rainfall or whatever, but we haven't put that in our comfort index. Something we might do, but um, hey, what do you think? How important is that to you compared to the temperature and uh, the high and low temperature during the days and also the, um, the humidity that you, that you have to put up with? Um, I'd love to hear back. Shoot me an email. Uh, you can write right on the chat window right now if you want and um, tell us what you think. So uh, Ron, just to uh, summarize, what we do with our calculation <clears throat> is we look at all the days of the year, the high and low for every day, of the, the average temperature over 20, a period of 20 years. Uh, and we look whether or not it falls within a range of, uh, of that. And if it doesn't fall within that range, rather than just say yes or no, let's say that a temperature uh, gets to 65 degrees instead of uh, 70 degrees as far as high temperature. Well, it still gets points. We measure how far off it is 
from, um, in other words, we scale and use the number of points by how many degrees it is away from the ideal. So we just don't count up the number of days that fall within a narrow range. We look at how much they vary from the range and uh, score it accordingly. And, and uh, we're busy bumping up right now our um, uh, penalty for humidity because we've gotten a lot of feedback from folks on that. So let's see what we got here on our, um, let's see. Um, No, uh, let's see, Becky is, um, <laughs> uh, Becky is, is talking about where, uh, where she is this year. Um, this year they had 145 inches of snow and they averaged 200 plus inches of snow a year. Wow. That is brutal. Um, yeah, we do have some really great snow data on our site. I will say this, Becky. Um, one thing that we've found that's really hard to get is uh, finding accurate snow information. For instance, we have um, precipitation data from the Weather Bureau, and they've done a great job with that. And we have um, temperature, uh, high and low, that sort of thing. But when it comes down to sort of nuances uh, and more granular detail, there's only a relatively few number of um, weather reporting stations that give snow data and often those the places you're interested in don't have that snow data but i'll tell you what what we've done is we have modeled uh nick has done most of the work on this nick arnold our uh cartographer slash climate scientist um he's done a bunch of work on modeling uh preparing some modeling uh to look at the elevation temperature so basically he's doing some spatial analysis if you will uh, to find the places and fill those in on the snow data and then test those against places that we do know. It's looking very good. So we do have some really accurate snow um, information on our site. I think it's some of the best on the internet. Um, so come to bestplaces.net and see what we've got. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Eve says uh, she's sorry uh, she can't listen to the broadcast, uh, but maybe hi Eve. If you're checking in later on the on the uh, um, on the recording that we've made of this, and it's on our website, uh, welcome. Thanks. Here's your question. Sorry I can't listen due to a lab appointment, but I do have a comment and question. Um, if 55 plus planned communities can find buyers for a small, efficiently laid out, single story freestanding houses and tiny houses seem to be gaining traction. Why don't developers consider rebuilding old but thriving walkable downtown areas with small thousand to 15 square, 1500 square foot houses like that where they're single and there's no associations? Um, I imagine she means like HMOs, homes, homeowners association with the fees and restrictions. I don't want to live in a planned or restricted community, but I'm looking forward to a time when I don't want to be dependent on a car for everything. But to be in a walkable downtown, people currently have to be willing in high density housing or live in something multiple, multi-story. Some of us want to downsize for, for convenience rather than cost cutting. So I don't see why builders don't want to take advantage of that. Okay, good question. You know, the first thing that comes to me is um, usually in downtowns they don't have single single um, single family houses. Uh, it's usually either you have the density which makes the downtown or you have the single family houses and they require more land so they're not going to be part of the downtown area. What they are going for more and more is something called mixed use development. And what's happening is, you, maybe you've seen these go in, in in places. Basically, they have a storefront on the bottom, and then they have uh, sort of condos or apartments up above. And uh, those are becoming more popular in places. Um, so you could look for mixed use development in the area that you're interested in and uh, look for that. So those, those are some things that they're doing. Also, what I'm finding is this sort of redevelopment of the downtown 
that's happening all over the country in small towns, large, large cities all over the US. Um, so more and more people are repurposing. Developers are smart. They're going to go where the money is. And they're looking for the places where they're going to make a buck. And what people want to do, the young people and people like yourself, Eve, uh, people and like myself of an older age, we want to um, have a walkable area with things to do. So what they're going to do is they're going <clears> to <throat> uh, develop these core in the city core and have this walkable area. Right now, Eve, I, I don't see anything where they're going to have a, you're going to have small houses in a really sort of a downtown area. Um, and what will happen, what is happening is people are actually building sort of like almost a small town. This is sort of a new thing. Unfortunately, they are heavily, um, I wouldn't say restricted, but let's say there are lots of rules coming with these things. They're sort of the almost a small town center. Uh, with uh, houses around it. They're not very affordable and they're usually high end, uh, high prices and they're pretty restrictive as far as their covenants uh, and that sort of thing. But they're pretty cool. Uh, I got to say that uh, some of them are very livable if one has the money, uh, but they're, people are looking to create that sort of small town feel <clears throat> in a planned development. So that's kind of cool. Um, like I said, if a person can afford it and if one wants to put up with those sort of restrictions. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I can't be more specific, but there are also other places I know, like I was visiting Rockford, Illinois. Uh, in close to their downtown, they have lots of houses that are sort of, they've been, they've been overlooked and sort of ignored very affordable small towns uh, small houses like you're, you're talking about um, are requiring a lot of sort of um, reconstruction and development and um, that's kind of a challenge but people are thinking about that especially as more and more people want to leave the suburbs and move downtown where the action is <clears throat> Um, let's see what we have. <clears throat> oh, we got a, a from Bill, um, who works with an insurance group. Does your crime data tool uh, now include a census block perspective? Still only zip code. Yes, uh, and Bill, it is still only zip code. We're working on doing that. We have some other initiatives that I've been talking about that we'd like to get out there first. Uh, later this year, though, we're looking to get the uh, crime index more granular. By the way, this is one thing we're going to build out for everyone. Um, we have over 9,000 cities around in the U.S. We have some detailed uh, crime data for those. And we also have it going back almost 20 years. I think we're like at 19 years it goes back. Um, we're going to be putting that on so you can see how the crime rates, and this is detailed crime information from the FBI for these 9,000 cities. We'll put those up also when we build out our crime uh, data later this year. That'll be pretty interesting, I think, and it's interesting to see how crime uh, evolves. We're also gonna have it compare with other places around the US, and these are places that are sort of peer cities. In other words, it doesn't make sense to compare a city of 10,000 people with New York City. It would be more interesting to compare that particular 10,000 population place with other cities in that state and other cities of the same size around the country to see how they're doing. I haven't seen anything like that on the web, but that would be interesting to do. And that's what we're going to bring to you. <clears throat> okay. So um, what we have here is um, uh, Sandra says, is Williamsburg, Virginia, a good place to retire? How are the medical services there for over the over 60 set? Finally, have you been to Charlottesville lately? They're building everywhere there. And is the city really paying attention and planning uh, to whether the roads and other services will accommodate this development? All right, good question. So Sandra, haven't been to Charlottesville. Well, hold on, I was there a year and a half ago. Okay, um, so Charlottesville, yes, it is growing. Um, are they planning 
Uh, I hope so. Uh, it's tough. When somewhere, in, uh, when a place is getting popular, it's very tough to sort of control that growth and channel it in a healthy way. And I have to say, I'm partly responsible for Charlottesville um, growing as much as it has been. We picked that uh, with the first edition of our city's ranked and rated book, a bestseller. Uh, I was on the Today Show talking about it. And um, yeah, Charlottesville is a great place to live. And uh, it is getting more crowded as other people uh, recognize that. It is a college town, University of Virginia. And uh, it's a very nice place to live. The home of Monticello, uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, President Jefferson, of course. And um, so much history and everything there. It is, uh, it is growing and um, it is a challenge. I hope they manage it well. I've spoken to some people there. Interestingly, uh, they had a group of people there called, um, I forget, Abermall. Uh, it's a group, anyway, basically trying to say, let's put a curb on growth. We don't have to grow to be great. And frankly, I, take, I took away from those meetings, um, I think I'm kind of a believer now. I don't think a city has to continually to grow in order to still be a great city. And I think there's maybe a right size for certain cities. Um, I don't like to see them keep growing because then they lose what's special about it. And I think that every time uh, a place grows, it changes. And why not uh, maybe a place, uh, the core can go ahead and stay the same size and maybe the surrounding satellite areas can go ahead and grow. For instance, San Francisco, does it have to pack more and more people in? I think it becomes less special. Why not the surrounding cities like Oakland, Oakland is growing uh, and other places around that on the other side of the bay and so on. Um, San Jose, Palo Alto, those are already growing and then crazy high prices there. But why not go ahead and let other places grow and then maybe San Francisco can remain more of what's special about it. Now, I know that some people are gonna say, well, if you go ahead and restrict the population, it's gonna get more and more expensive. Yeah, I understand that. Well, guess what? It's gonna get more and more expensive anyway. I have never seen any rent control or try to control higher home prices. I haven't seen that work in any case. New York City is still very, very, well, maybe the most expensive place in the U.S. for any large city. San Francisco, uh, L.A., any place is going to be, any place where people want to move, the prices are going to increase, and there doesn't seem to be anything the government can do about it. So why not go ahead and let the other cities grow? In fact, we're seeing that here on the West Coast. San Francisco is becoming less and less affordable. Uh, and what's happening is companies are, are moving out. They're being moving to places like Phoenix and uh, they're moving to places like Portland or they're having satellite offices where people are working remotely um, and maybe going into San Francisco or the Bay Area <clears throat> once every month or so to meet with the team. And what they're doing instead is uh, working in these other areas. <clears throat> and I think that's great. I think it's natural. Uh, and I think it gives more to the surrounding cities and let's let those develop. I don't see how New York City, San Francisco, LA and other places can keep growing indefinitely um, without it becoming, without systems just sort of breaking down and becoming unmanageable. <clears throat> anyway, that's my, my soapbox for today. Um, uh, let's see, Carolyn writes, uh, hello, I was looking and researching a place in North Carolina to relocate to, and I saw an article on the Raleigh or Holly Springs, North Carolina area. I've been interested in that area. It looks like it's a nice town. Would like to live outside Raleigh. Lived in Winston-Salem Triad area before, but would like to move to a different area. I love North Carolina. Uh, my question is, I would be needing a job and a place, um, Let's see, the cost of living in Holly Springs is um, high and would probably rent. So here's, well, it all depends, of course, on what your job is, Carolyn, and um, 
that's tricky. But here's what I found recently uh, going to uh, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. Uh, you know, they have the they have the area, the sort of the triangle area. Uh, they have Cary, they have Durham, um, like you said, Winston Salem. Those places are all in the same area. I found Cary to be, oh, I don't know, sort of. Um, it was more like a suburb kind of place. Uh, maybe I went to the wrong place or whatever, but uh, wrong area there. But I found it to be a little sterile. Uh, my favorite place um, would be to, <clears throat> and Chapel Hill, of course, has University of North Carolina. That's more of a college town. Rents are going to be crazy high there because all the college kids are going to rent. And um, it's going to be, I think, maybe unaffordable. I really like Durham. I really like Durham, North Carolina. It had a really great feel. Lots of interesting things going on. Um, I uh, home to uh, Duke, of course, and um, I don't know if um, I haven't checked what the home prices are on that. But of the area, I would check out the Durham area and then also other places around Raleigh. Uh, it is really cool. It's a really livable place. <clears throat> and it's more livable than a lot of, uh, well, climate-wise, it's more comfortable than other places. It's further inland away from the uh, um, oppressive humidity. But I would say check out Durham. I think that's that would be my pick. I thought it was very cool. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Uh, Ingrid said, just moved to South Carolina but can't find a job. Where are the best places for older adults to live and work? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, can't find a job. Well, you're going to have to, you want to stay away from places like maybe Charleston. Um, it's really expensive there and it is, it's a beautiful place, of course, but it's going to be expensive. Uh, coastal areas are going to be more expensive. Um, Again, I would look for, take a look at our site and look for places with low unemployment rate, uh, places that are growing, because those are places where people are moving to. And if they're moving to a place, if, they're, if the population is increasing, it's for a good thing. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time to do any more research. I would have picked some places for you, Kat, uh, Ingrid, but... Um, uh, I don't have anything. Don't have anything good for you off the top of my head. Check our site. Those things I told you about, and um, I'm I'm hopeful that you can find something that will work for you and you'll find a job there. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mike says, uh, my wife and I are looking to relocate to the Chattanooga area uh, for retirement to take advantage of all the better weather, and he says better than Connecticut anyway and economic climate. While most of the homes we're looking at seem to be on the I-75 corridor east of Chattanooga, we're also seeing quite a lot places across the border in Georgia. Keeping taxes low, of course, is important, but we don't want to com this to completely drive our decision. Do you see any differences in cost of living, availability of shopping, climate, etc., between the Tennessee side and Georgia? Well, the the Chattanooga metro area it straddles Tennessee and Georgia. In fact, three counties uh, in the metro area are in the um, Georgia area, uh, in the state of Georgia, and that's important. So um, I, since that's all in the metro area and you can travel for, say, shopping um, and that sort of thing, there aren't any real climate differences to speak of. There's not like a mountain range between the areas. It's all the same area. Um, so I would say look at the areas. I think they're basically the further out you're going to have more affordable. Uh, so I think it's up to you to find out what your particular tax situation is and if the differences between Tennessee and Georgia uh, would make a difference for you uh, as opposed to the price of housing. Price of housing is going to be the main driver. Um, and so our site's great. We have some really good price. Uh, some uh, our prices are up to date. They're easy to find. Also, take a look at Zillow uh, on houses and such. Uh, that would certainly um, work well. Let me go here and <laughs> excuse me. 
Um, Mark says um, he's looking at New Mexico for retirement, but the economy scares us a bit. We're looking at Albuquerque or Alamogordo. And in fact, I saw another one here, uh, another question um, where someone says uh, she wants to live in the Southwest, New Mexico or Colorado and uh, she wants to visit her children in Denver or Albuquerque. Well, and she wants to look at $23,000 a year, her budget. And that's uh, really bottom line. And Mark, this has a little bit overlap with what you're talking about because uh, you're talking about Alamogordo. I think Alamogordo is a very, very cool place. Las Cruces is another place to look at. Albuquerque is a much bigger town. Um, so I would say, I would say, Mark, um, yeah, Alma Gordo is a very, it has a really, uh, it has a lot of smart people living there as far as, for whatever reason, I forget the reason, whether it was maybe the uh, White Sands um, proving ground they had there or whatever, uh, and Las Cruces as well. But uh, they have a lot of uh, very, one of the highest levels of college educated people maybe um, in that region, living there as well. Uh, and Albuquerque is neat. It's a bigger town. It's sprawling. I don't like it as much. If you're looking more for a New Mexico feel uh, and um, Sioux, something place cheaper, definitely look south of Albuquerque. Santa Fe, by the way, is the state capital. It's going to be pretty expensive. It's an arts town. Uh, it's, very, it's a very cool and hip place to be. Um, it's going to be pretty much out of range. Uh, I would definitely say that. So look south of uh, Albuquerque. Look at Alamogordo. Um, Albuquerque. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Al uh, Alamogordo, Las Cruces, and where was the other place? Truth or Consequences, uh, New Mexico. Take a look at those places. Uh, Truth or Consequences probably be your cheapest. And Mark, I would say Alba, Al, Alamogordo is a really cool spot. Take a look at that. Also check out Las Cruces. I would say that's my, my pick. In fact, also look at El Paso, Texas. I was really impressed with El Paso. I don't think, uh, I think it gets overlooked a lot. It's very cool. 600,000 people. It's, it's a big city. And um, the crime rate is low uh, and the economy is coming back nicely there. So I think that's a cool spot uh, to be as well. Um, let's see. We're coming up on, gee, are we already only seven minutes left? I could do this all day. I don't know if you can listen to me all day, <laughs> but I could uh, definitely talk about this all day. We'll go out and grab some lunch and then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and talk about it over lunch, okay? <laughs> um, Let's see, uh, someone, Patty says, is there a place that uh, if she has to rent, how do I avoid rent increases that come at renewal time um, that will be cost prohibitive on a fixed income? And she says, um, like in Orlando, rents are very competitive and each time you come up for renewal, the price changes. Wow, that varies by jurisdiction. Uh, some places, some cities have restrictions against that, how much they can raise the rent and such. We don't have that information. I don't know of any place that has it city by city. So that's tough. If you're looking at a place, you just have to see what it's like to, um, uh, to be there as a, uh, as a renter. And do, and she also says, is there a cheat sheet of questions to ask pro and con about a place to live? Uh, each person would have their individual questions based on their preferences, but basically what are good questions to ask for a majority of situations? Uh, for instance, does this uh, location get good Wi-Fi without having to go to extremely expensive additional add-ons? Uh, I don't know about the Wi-Fi thing, uh, Patty, but um, you know that's a really good question. What are, if you're the detective, what is sort of the roadmap for you to find the best place uh, for yourself. I mentioned look for a good economy, look for a stable economy, look for um, uh, state capitals, uh, look for college towns. 
Um, look for things to do. make sure you, if you need a job, you can go ahead and get one. I will say that look, if you're interested in finding people like yourself, look at a site called Meetup, Meetup, M-E-E-T-U-P.com. And you can find people doing all sorts of things all over the United States, even the world. You can find people that like the same things you do. You can contact them and find out what it's like to live there. That's a great thing to do. Also, you can go to Airbnb, which is one of our partners. You can go to Airbnb. In fact, you can log it through our site. We get a couple of bucks to help keep us going. If you uh, rent something through Airbnb through our site, we get a few bucks. So thanks very much. It help, helps, helps us keep the lights on. And um, Airbnb is a great thing. It's cheaper than a motel in most cases. What's more, you can stay right in the neighborhood that you're interested in or uh, maybe a neighborhood every two or three nights. You can spend a week in a place, get a complete feel for what it's like. Uh, that's a great tip. Also go online, listen to the radio. Uh, local TV station is gonna have clips, things they're gonna talk about. And um, look at, read the newspapers. Newspapers are often online as well. If they're not behind a firewall, you can read the local newspapers. So just quickly, those are some tips I would say to get a real feel for a place, not just the, uh, not just how much the houses cost or how much it costs to rent, but also what it will, what it's like to live there. So I would do that. We should go ahead and write something like that down for you and have, uh, maybe we'll put it maybe in a, like an ebook or something quick you can take a look at and uh, use as tips for your search. Well, we're getting down to three minutes left. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, well, um, there, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Richard is living in Rochester, New York. And uh, he just turned 84. And he's looking up to perhaps move. Uh, he just cannot take the winters anymore. I just cannot stand the cold, it's true. Uh, one of our, uh, in fact, both uh, both uh, Bertrand and Ted with our group here, the, they spent uh, college up in uh, uh, New Hampshire and uh, upstate New York. And uh, I can say that the winters in up there are bleak, bleak and hard <clears throat> in upstate New York and uh, New England. So what they are doing, uh, what, what Richard is uh, thinking of doing is moving to High Point, North Carolina. And um, what would that be like? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I would say the best thing is to talk to people that you know down there. He mentions that he does know, he has been in contact with someone. Um, I would say the best thing you can do, if you know someone that lives in an area, ask them about a particular place and also find out more online with like our site, bestplaces.net. But uh, local resources are often wonderful uh, because then you can ask them some specific questions. Um, let's see, I think that's pretty, well, we're down to this. Um, I'm here in our chat window, I see that we have, um, Linda says, what are the best and least expensive places to retire? So we're looking for the, the Venn diagram where it crosses. What's, what's the best place and the least expensive place uh, to retire? Uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, great. Uh, a lot of people are looking at Eastern Washington now, like Spokane and Walla Walla are also very good. Uh, around the Bend area, which is um, more central Oregon. Uh, I would say those are all really good places uh, on the West Coast. California is going to be really expensive. Um, otherwise, there's lots of good things to say about it. And I think that, uh, oh, we still got any other places I can come up here in the West. I would say look at Eastern Washington, definitely. Uh, Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is also a very a beautiful spot to be as well. Uh, and Twin Falls, the Boise area, outside Boise, that's growing up quickly. And some places in Montana as well, uh, Missoula and um, Great Falls uh, are, I think, are coming along very nicely. You can look at those and see what you think of those. The weather's going to be 
Uh, those are all high desert areas anywhere uh, eastern Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and um, Montana. So it'll be a little bit challenging, but it's going to be lack of humidity, dry, and the economy is coming along really perking along nicely without getting overheated. So I recommend all those places. And I see it is one o'clock here on the Pacific Coast and uh, four o'clock uh, on the East Coast. And um, so that's the end of our show. This is number 10 in the can. This is Bert Sperling with Sperling's Best Places. And we can be found on the internet at uh, www.bestplaces.net. I hope you come visit us. And I would love it if you can share something about where you live because you're the expert where you live. And everybody really would like to know what sort of insight you have about where you live. Tell us what you love about it. Tell us what you dislike about it. I'm sure there's some things about it that are less than perfect. And uh, love to hear from you. Anyway, Bert Sperling checking out. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.